Uh, welcome, guys, back to the Ox podcast. Uh, today we have Charlotte Fong, the founder of Milady and Remelia uh, NFT sets, and I'll let him introduce himself, really. Welcome. Yep. Thank you, Zoo. Uh, nice to meet you, and thanks for having me on. Um, yep, that's right. Founder of Remelia, CEO, and Milady Maker, Remelia, Bonker. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, so off the top of the that like how did you how did you get started and like how did you come up with this stuff uh well actually originally when we started Vermilia, my goal was to move into um to bring net heart into the nft space um i come up from an art background and in the 2010s there was a kind of movement called post-internet art um and this is we're talking about the real world art world it's like a new york scene and it collapsed um largely due to the inability to financialize a digital art in a gallery context. Um, I was watching that, but I was, I was more like high school age, and I saw that and realized that, you know, I wasn't really interested in pursuing an MFA and entering that space because it's my interest was in digital art. But, you know, the, it, the, the scene itself, it just people had to, like, move into more traditional painting practices and other, other elements that were uh, just... They, they moved away from any kind of radicalism engaging in a, in that kind of online space. Um, so I started doing writing and stuff on like Twitter before that on uh, um, the Fediverse and exploring these kind of like performance works, like trolling people with um, like uh, back then I was engaging in accelerationist um, theory as a like sort of theory fiction. Uh, when NFTs came around, I realized there was a chance to merge these things together and bring like a financialization into these art practices, basically to financialize the cult. Um, so Milady was our first NFT, but before that we had done Yale as a coin. We later we released it as a NFT, but Yale was like a meme coin um, that was also similar to Milady, kind of defining a sort of distinct brand of posting and uh, like a kind of lifestyle cult. It was very, you know, hardcore masculine, masculine, high testosterone, uh, cocaine capitalism. Um, it was a lot more short-lived though, because meme coins are a lot harder to maintain. Um, we realized the PFP NFT meta was much more sustainable for what we were, we were looking for there. So that's how we ended up um, designing and releasing the lady. Then um, that was successful, though it took a few months to mint out. Then we uh, released Remilio as a kind of um, different form of Milady that was engaging less on the love posting and more back into that kind of crypto culture, the shit post, like meme, meme coin stuff that we were doing with Yale. So that's how we ended up with these two big branches, so kind of brother and sisters, two sides of a uh, different online posting, the crypto scene. And what about the Milady derivatives? Are, are you involved in those or are those kind of community uh, growths from the, from, from the two original ones? Well, what we had done was um, back when we had launched Milady, uh, the other PFP NFTs, that, like, um, Yuga Labs, and the other like various uh, like uh, animal PFPs, like pudgy penguins or lazy lions or whatever, their stance with derivatives was basically to either ignore them, sometimes sue them, or just treat them as um, kind of parasitic runoffs um, of their own projects. Uh, we took a we took an opposite stance and we said embrace them, encourage a sort of decentralized art making, like. Um, if people produce derivatives, my theory was that it it confirmed our ascendancy as an upstream project. If um, you know, you have these animal adjective PFP NFTs that all came downstream of Bored Apes, and those kind of confirm that Bored Apes was the king in that field of NFTs. Similarly, if we embrace these kind of derivative neo chibi PFPs that were clearly downstream of our work. It would, it would, it, it makes it makes a, a unrejectable that mm. we're this new um, influence stream of influence in like this kind of what we called it was all about NFTs, the space of alt NFTs that we had been pioneering. Um, God, I I took the angle from uh, Toho, which is where we get the name Romilia. It's a Toho character. Toho is uh, the the Japanese. Um, it's like a they're bullet hell shooters and kind of it's not anime, but they have like anime characters that. Um, that derived from the from these video games and it blew up because um the the zoom the developer of toho had um embraced people to do uh doshin works like derivative fan works of like his characters and then 
he took the derivative work that they were doing and reincorporated them back into his into his games, like new characters they made or designs they expanded of his characters. Um, so it allowed it to kind of, as a one man uh, show, he was able to have a very large influence because he had that he had that embrace of kind of decentralized um, art gotcha. production. I guess stepping back then and then kind of thinking about Milady, I mean, what what do you think are the aesthetics of neo chibiism and like what do you think is like you know you, you mentioned the idea of like a a classical poster in the Milady style or in the Romilio style i mean do you mm -hmm. do you think that the popularity has come from initially the like what what kind of people did it attract in the beginning what what did you expect it to attract and like and what do you consider like the i the, the canonical Milady or Romilio? well uh to, to your first point about what defines the neo chibi look, that's a it's a it's a kind of um, a, aesthetic imagery that I what I describe it as a left hand style. And what I mean by that is kind of sometimes I encourage the artist in the collective to to I want I want them to draw in a not technically sophisticated way, even if they are trained as illustrators. Then I say use draw with your mouse or draw with your left hand. Um, what well, he was actually drawn with the mouse. Um, on like Photoshop instead mm -hmm. of using any kind of proper drawing apps. Uh, and what I'm looking for is that feeling of like some 12 year old drawing their favorite anime characters in like a way that looks, it evokes anime, but it's not really, it feels like a slightly weirded, but also it has that kind of DIY ethos of like, um, mm. you know, it, it feels like you can make it yourself. It's kind of funny because people will criticize like contemporary art saying, oh, I can do that myself. but we with Romilia, we we try to have that feeling because we want to like how like the milady derivatives too like they see our, our work and they think well i could do that a lot of them are, aren't produced by artists they're just almost like it's like devs doing their own art and i prefer it that way it's very easy to find anyone um technically sophisticated in illustration it's kind of funny that now all those people are uh, panicking as ai replaces them um I've, I've never had much respect for that kind of, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very easy to learn that technical skill. It's just a matter of practice. I don't think it constitutes artistry. Um, but Interesting. The, the Neo Chibi, the way, well, the reason I coined that term when I was just describing the lady uh, is, uh, is that it's like the Chibi work of, um, you know, it's the Chibi just means like a sort of uh, that cutesy form of anime. Like the, it looks a little bit like a toddler and it has like exaggerated larger anatomy like eyes and such. Um, the Neo Chibi is just a Western take on that drawn with this kind of childish feeling. Um, the reason why we picked that direction for the Milady PFP was um, because a, uh, I wanted something that was more love-pilled and it had that in innocent sweetness, um, but still in the realm of uh, anime, especially Chibi, because I feel that those larger expressive eyes uh, they it creates a kind of uh, easier parasocial relationship when somebody has these kind of anime pictures as their profile picture. Um, it, I think it's just a, a product of being able to empathize when you can see the eyes clearly in a profile picture. So we did it quite a bit of iteration, um, just wearing the profile and variating it and testing it on on our posting um, before we actually released it as a as an NFT. Um, and you know, like. Uh, I think actually like Lucas is a great example of somebody who, if you give him a different PFP, it clearly changes the tone of his posting. Um, that's the ideal mm -hmm. output. It's, mm -hmm. it's not true for everybody, but it people that are more in tune with the, the posting that they have and the way the timeline responds um, will mm -hmm. be, they'll be affected by the profile that they wear. Um, for sure. So in a sense, you can kind of engineer the output you get. So then, when you look at like Milady versus Vermilio, this a lot of conscious thought was put into how do we differentiate it. I wanted to make sure when we release a second collection that essentially these were different tribes of posters. Um, so if Milady, we have this kind of um, chaotic love pilled schizo posting. I wanted Vermilio to be the similar, the same kind of schizo posting, but on the more racist, masculine, boyish side of like Q and on racist shit posting, um, which is somewhat out of place for the Miladies. Um, mm -hmm. I also wanted to kind of court 
the more meme coin degen um, type posters in CT that also again isn't really doesn't really fit into the lady posting, which is more you know e girl friendly. Um, actually, with Milady, I had a male artist draw the the ladies, but for Emilio, I had a female artist draw draw them. I, I wanted mm -hmm. I wanted to do it that because I uh, I uh, I feel that there's a kind of yin and yang with gender uh, and to have a minor masculine and, and a major feminine or vice versa, it creates a, a, a better unity that's more more appealing than just having something be bluntly male or female. Uh, so the Romilio awesome. is uh, it's kind of, we, we, we were using like South Park as a reference with like that kind of cardboard cutout feeling, but uh, it, I wanted to have like an innate seed of like cuteness to it. This kind of, I think that's what draws in some of its charm. It still feels like a little bit of a blush, like a, it's like a, it's boyish, but it's more like, you know, your 13 year old younger brother, he still has red cheeks, even though he's running around spamming the N word online. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, but, so, so do you personally identify more as a Milady or as a Romilio or it's like a spectrum or how do you like? Uh, actually, I was using the, the Romilio, the original Romilio uh, that we derived the whole collection from was a uh, sort of, I guess you can call it an honorary. Um, one of the artists in Romilio Collective had produced for me early on, actually, even before we had launched Milady. Um, and that's what I had been using. Wow. That's a C-Fang kind of classic Hawaiian shirt with the gun um, avatar. Um, hmm. and so I do identify nice. with that. Um, I think it's a little more hard edged. Um, I mean, I, uh, I don't know. I, I would say a kind of a synthesis of both. I think both tribes are like different, different angles of um, my general like posting ethos because prior to Milady, and when you asked like, well, what was the original audience of Milady? I mean, it was mostly people that had come in from our sphere prior um, with like Mia and Kaliak. And then like, we were doing Romilio stuff for like nine months or so before we had released Milady. Um, and that sphere of like posters that evolved out of Kaliak, there was already a kind of distinct Romilia type person though, it didn't have a name for itself until we launched Milady. Before that, they were just known as Calvary posters. So on Mia, I already had this kind of synthesis of like a cute girl, like it was pretending to be like a Hapitamines uh, white girl. Um, it was posting like hardcore, like accelerationist discourse um, with this aura of, uh, of very high Q, high high Q violence. Um, so with when we did Milady, I. Uh, cleaned out any of that sort of scariness, that violence um, is more, mm -hmm. any violence is sort of uh, put in this Hello Kitty veneer. Um, yeah, I think the Milady aesthetic is super interesting. I mean, maybe I can go into my history with Milady and my journey through it. I mean, I would say I, I probably skipped the first phase where you guys had more of the <clears throat> very early like gorilla stuff and I missed the whole anorexia stuff. I mean, I later read about it a little bit, but uh, it wasn't a big theme. It kind of was just something that happened. And I and I and later people asked me like, what do I think about it? And I was like, I really don't know what to think about it. Um, and uh, but I was just really impressed by the tone of let's say like chaotic good, like uh, perpetual optimism that I felt Milady's tended to uh, post with. And I think there was kind of a post irony to it as well, where it's like, you know, uh, there's a there's a very genuine affirmativeness to it. At the same time, there's a genuine like uh, edginess to it, right? But that, but I think that that edgy genuine is always like that non-duality. Whereas, like when people are trying to be really uh, like always with the times and saying exactly what's correct, then they end up actually being like, you know, like AI. And whereas when when Milady's post at that time, I felt like it was a very um, uh, you know, it, it almost allowed them to say what they wanted to say, uh, mm -hmm. but they wouldn't, uh, they, they would be affirmed for their uniqueness. So I guess another way to think about it is like a very non-judgmental sphere. Uh, it's kind of like an internet bastion of non-judgmental. Because like, um, I think that, I think that, uh, you know, there, there's this idea at the time, like, and then Lucas, uh, who at the time was working with us 
on uh, thinking about the Ox fund or the Ox uh, brand and thinking about, you know, what what does it look like? And, it, and I think, you know, he, I think uh, Oxdow, he told me, you know, Miladies are really cool because it's just like people uh, post about whatever and uh, it's it's a genuine it's a genuine kind of energy that uh, people don't spend let's say 90% of their posts like saying what's wrong with other people for instance or people don't spend a lot of their time doing that kind of stuff so so that that I think w was my original inspiration into it where I felt like you know uh, it it's like a ready-made community almost, but at the same time, it's like, uh, you know, people are like they, I think they embody both sides of the Hello Kitty as you described it and the violence side as you described it. So there's mm -hmm. stuff that they tweet, which is prop, like, you know, what what, what you describe as schizo, I guess. Um, but I guess um, over time, I, I do feel the Milady community is evolving. I mean, as the price goes up, it, it always evolves. I think after the Elon tweet evolves as well. Um, and I talk to GCR about this all, all the time about like, what is the end game Milady community? Like, cause, cause you know, we, we had followed like apes and punks in the past and it's like, you know, mm -hmm. as the community changes over time, it takes on a different flavor. Um, and the other thing I noticed was that a lot of the, you know, smart young devs in crypto, they love Milady stuff, right? They, it's like a very, very, it really speaks to them, I think. Cause it's like, you know, it's like they're in the arena trying things and okay. Mm -hmm. You know, their project fails. Is it a rug? Is it a to the scam you know they're they're also not sure their users also not sure and then they relaunch it again you know so sometimes when malays are accused of like launching a lot of like meme coins or scam coins right and then it's like and then they just keep doing because it it's like okay well you're you know we're all playing the game right so i think that was like my initial drive to it and then uh it actually is true like i didn't really know you could you could be like a uh you could be a male milady like not that i thought everyone was female but i just thought that like, I didn't really know what Romilio was. And I was just like, you know, I'll just choose a Milady. Uh, and uh, now I feel like, you know, I don't know if I should have chosen a Romilio in, in the first place, but. Uh, Actually, I think you're a good Milady poster because uh, you post mm. with a bit of Cohen style wisdom, which is very Milady. Um, I think early on, our earliest uh, pickup among CT was with devs. And I think a large reason for that was we had. Um, I had been writing a lot about like kind of a, the cyber anarchist ethos, which I think was with DGENs coming in and traders into like, you know, 2017 ish uh, crypto that, that had kind of gotten forgotten. But a lot of the devs, it's what had brought them like, especially like each protocol type type devs. Um, they had been interested in that and it was refreshing to see it coming, especially from NFTs, which are the most uh, diluted of all crypto so far. Um, I think, so for a lot of them, it felt like an NFT project that actually came from, you know, a background that they understood. Um, like I wasn't, I wasn't involved first in crypto for trading reasons. I had been interested in like actual, like cyberpunk ethos. Um, so I think that also translates to commitments to like free speech and anti-censorship. It's that resistance to the state ethos that like lady in, in my writing still embodies strongly uh, even like uh, <laughs> when that like the covid vaccine st vaccine stuff was happening i um i remember we were getting canceled a little bit among nft projects because we didn't give a shit about if you had the vax card for N nyc raves but like that's a clear example of like do you have that anarchist ethos or not <laughs> are you going to be cut by the state or are you not going to give a shit it's the same as like when you get like Web3 entryists coming in and like trying to censor people for general like DEI stuff, it's um, well, you just completely stood against all of that kind of corpo nonsense, which especially at the time and still now, most NFT projects are just, you know, they're not going to be hold a banner of shit posting. Melody has completely like been the sole project to, Melody and our derivatives have been the sole ones to actually like just openly be, uh, you know, CT and on DGEN shit posters. Super interesting. I think, um, what do you like, what do you think about the, the mainstream adoption of Milady? Cause it's starting to feel like we, we are entering a 
mass adoption wave for Milady, right? Like you had Elon mm-hmm. Musk tweet about it. Like, why do you think that happened? Like, how do you think he, he got to see it and then decided to tweet it? Uh, well, that I do know. I'm not sure how much I can share, but um, we, uh, you know, my previous writing on Mia covered a lot of um, discussion on like accelerationism as well as just VR, AR, and, and uh, kind of deep fakes. Like, and all, all of these topics are becoming a lot more relevant, especially like this last year. Um, even like effective accelerationism had become very um, relevant in the Bay Area scene, but the original manifesto is like has direct like, references to my own writing on Mia. Um, it's a, uh, it, it's, we're, I'm somewhat well read in those scenes. And I think right now, basically, the Overton window and the cultural pendul- pendulum is swinging just to to um, occupy similar spaces. Um, I think Moody will naturally just, the, I think culture will just basically um, come downstream to occupy the same space that Moody is currently sitting on, essentially. Um, that's that's the mainstream pivot is just basically we we stay in the same place we are and people will more and more come to follow. Um, even as an example, like one of the, the uh, the dietary like uh, uh, subcultures that I subscribe to and push heavily among our community is Ray Pete um, and things like seed oils. Um, you know, just a few years ago, it was just some kind of esoteric um, conspiracy to be against seed oils and to think that's responsible for modern ailments. And more and more, it's just becoming very mainstream, it's just common knowledge at least within like the zoomer generation uh these are just things that i think when you're right and you're just taking advantage of basically the information marketplace of these kind of esoteric um uncensored online communities um they'll naturally tend to to reach truth at a much Mm -hmm. better efficiency than the mainstream and if you're just in tune with it um you can make conviction bets that will be accurate and then culture will slowly come around to follow uh, enough of those conviction bets and people will just, that, that pan out to be true, people just end up trusting the, the kind of mound you, you make for yourself. Mm-hmm. So, it's so, really like, so you, I see this mm-hmm. like planting flags down and we make a lot of conviction bets. Even like when you look at like our raves, um, even the music selection that we do is very like, kind of a uh, new new wave of like underground SoundCloud type breakcore um, that uh, is becoming more and more popular. But when we started, it wasn't that well known. Um, you know, these are, these are the kind of bets that then make us well known among like a completely different subculture of like Zoomers on SoundCloud that has nothing to do with CT, but and they're not awesome. going to be buying the lady at all. But it, it mm. ends up, you, you tend to have this kind of upstream influence that reflects back in the price eventually. So as, a, as an example, like Elon Musk, like that's just, it's downstream of like Grimes, it's downstream of like accelerationism, which is downstream of like like Nick Land, who um, was like forgotten and rejected by his own like kind of theory cell people because of his uh, embrace of like NRX and like racist stuff. So that it was too taboo for the academics to touch. Um, but it wasn't something that I, I cared about, you know, um, I wasn't concerned about that tabooness. So I continued to write about him. Um, and eventually it, it made its way into a diluted form of effective accelerationism. So like mm-hmm. these, these, uh, you you see these kind of stra- uh, trend lines um, flow and a lot of the edge is just basically to not be concerned about that um, kind of tabooness, just to step completely outside of any existing Overton window and operate just with fully seeking out what's true to make conviction bets on. Mm. I do think even Elon's like personality is very Milady in some sense, right? I mean, he's obviously very pro free speech in a way he bought Twitter mm-hmm. just to kind of give free speech as a gift to the people in a way. Mm-hmm. And I think also, um, you know, just his attitude toward the press and his attitude toward, you know, ma- making his own kind of, uh, he's not afraid to take on views that are well outside the Overton window at that time, but maybe later it shifts into it. I think, I think that, um, I mean, I think we also share, I think a, a kind of a belief that 
it's kind of a Straussian belief that you know truth is in the esoteric or in the you know mm -hmm. forgotten communities of and the, the I think the internet in a way uniquely enables that um, mm -hmm. uh, those people to find each other and then to like probe truths and you know in an uncensorable environment they find those truths and they and they share these and they, and it creates like a secret of the tribe and secret of the tribe is a is a term I use a lot uh, internally when I discuss, you know, why do communities have resounding value and, and lasting value? And I think it's because they share a secret together that the mm -hmm. outside world doesn't know, but they know that that's why they will all band together kind of thing. So I feel like Malay, that's uh, very much an energy that it has, right? Because I, oh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's such a nice, it's such a nice kind of, you know, dichotomy, right? Where the, you know, mainstream media might say, well, this is like not Nazi anorexia called anti-Semitic, they can use a hundred different words, but then Malays are like, keep it coming, right? You know, keep the attention mm -hmm. coming and also keep the energy coming. So, so I think that, you know, Elon with his battles with the media now too. And I mean, to, for me, for a lesser extent, like obviously, you know, we, we obviously also shared controversial, uh, uh, you know, sto stories with the media and, and so on. I just think that uh, Malady is a very doubt, for me, it's a very Taoist concept because it's like, it takes the energy and it says, is this negative or is this positive? You don't, you don't know, right? Like you don't really know what's mm -hmm. negative, what's positive. And it also is a very, it's a very finessed, it's a very fluid kind of a, you know, so I love, I love that you talk, talked about like the gendering of, of like, you know, Romilio was by a woman and then Milady by a man, because I think that ironically, I think uh, Milady is the most trans of the, of the, I'm, I'm not trans or anything, but I'm just saying like, it's a, it's a, such a funny, concept it's like transracial because i think your brand especially <laughs> struck me as like not even transgender but transracial right because i think mm -hmm. transracialism and post identity is also really is also really um up like you know a huge trend i see uh you see stuff where you know people especially in the west they they aspire to japanese anime or korea or vice versa and, and i and i think that um you know, it's not a coincidence that that black or Chinese filter is so popular. People genuinely <laughs> want, people genuinely want to be like, if I could just be black for one day, if I could just be Chinese for one day, what is it like? You know, it, and that's a new thing. That That's not a thing that people used to do. So I don't know, mm -hmm. it's, maybe I'm rambling now, but but I do think that Milady, uh is a hyper fluid, uh, is a hyper fluid concept. And, and I think that it, it, um, the inability to grasp it in in sim, in a very simple way, I think, creates that uh, perpetual secret of the tribe. That uh, that mm -hmm. perpetual secret, as long as it's guarded, you know. Because I felt what happened with apes is like it was cool in the beginning. You know, you give it away, you, people give it away to, and then it was a lot of traders and, and so on. And then over time, you know, the celebrities come in, and you know, the actors come in, and you know, the the moon pay guys give it to celebrities and then have them hold it and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I mean, I don't know, shenanigan type stuff. And then at the end, you know, it becomes cringe, right? Like the, like the kind of like base to cringe uh, thing goes in a loop. And then maybe now the price is lower. Now the community is harder and, you know, the fast money leaves. And then it's like cool again. Because everything, if you wait, it's like fashion, right? Like everything, if you wait long enough, it's just cool again. And everything, if it's too cool, then it becomes cringe again. So mm -hmm. uh, like, do you think Malays will become very cringe at some point? Do you think it already has become cringe at times? Or how do you see that evolving as the price goes up inexorably? Um, well, honestly, I think uh, the Nazi anorexia cult is a great design to prevent that from ever happening. I think it makes a permanent commitment to being in the edge mm. of an avant-garde. It's um, you're you're forced to commit to a radicalness to embrace it, and it's something that will always stay in the edge of um, kind of public, uh, you know, goodwill. But at the same time, it is, as you say, like a secret because it's just it is artificial. It, you know, it happened to somewhat inadvertently. The original anorexia cult meme, it, was, uh, it wasn't meant to be slapped onto Milady. But when we did do it, it was for the same reasons. We were just trolling and trying to create a controversy that just expanded the Mia cult that existed then by just growing um, this personality by in entering more and more infamy at bigger and bigger trolls. Um, it just happened to be that we decided to troll like Ed Twitter, ED Twitter, um, and like Instagram. But uh, when it got uh, 
dug up and then thrown onto Moiety and attempt to cancel as we just embraced it for the same reasons. Mm -hmm. um, it's for anybody with any internet nativity, you know, the first thought when you hear it, even with no familiarity with anything else, is that it sounds like a troll. And when you look into it for 10 minutes, it's obvious it is. Um, but if you're a normie without that nativity, you, you, you'll get tricked and confused and, you know, mm -hmm. offended. Um, it's not like the intent is simply to just offend in an edgy way, but it does act as a screening measure. And then it makes it for anybody that does come over that screen, they're more committed into the tribe, as you say, they're in on the secret. I think there's also an element of going through these kind of um, attacks on the tribe help form a lot of bonds and loyalty within the tribe. Um, definitely, the, the cancel was only good for Milady. It grew it, uh, the, the bond of the community a lot closer together. Um, over time, too, the Milady set actually fell for the, the cancel, came back, and when they realized, you know, it was just BS, um, and it only made them also stronger and more loyal because, you know, they realized that they thought they got betrayed and they realized they weren't, and it was just, you know, bad faith normies were the, I mean, the motivation for canceling Milady or anything, and especially art, is just um, destruction of what's entertaining or beautiful or interesting. It's just a, it's a, it's a very black pill that those to participate in. And that kind of, it became a clear example when it was a artificially like manifested um, cancel, like a fake, a fake controversy. Um, uh, going back also to uh, what, what you said about post-identity, it's definitely something um, I think is a big part of Milady. Um, we also see it in our Chinese posting as well. It's a disaster of so um, anybody could be Chinese. You could be a cute Chinese girl um, if you want to be. Uh, I, we, we really embrace that from the beginning because um, I think it's, it's a key part of this side of the internet, this kind of underground internet native um, sphere. The biggest play, the, biz, the, the biggest element is this post-identity that you can just be whatever you want to be and just invent an entire fake identity. I mean, um, one element is just being purely anonymous and you just have some you know, random name. You could have like a dog with your, with your profile picture, some cat. On the other side is you have a totally fake identity that has nothing to do with your real one, but it's not like you're catfishing. You're just, you're just recognizing the, the irrelevance of identity online. Of course, this goes completely against when people try to bring in like DI woke garbage into like these online spaces because they're they've built these entire ideologies around emphasizing their identity in the front. But when you look at like what Elon Musk's approach to Twitter, which is also like Jack Dorsey's original version of Twitter, is a free uh, marketplace of ideas. It's contingent on this lack of identity when you're presenting any ideas. If you're evaluating people's uh, conversation and discourse based on who they are rather than what they're saying, then you, you, um, you know, you fail, you fail John Smith's idea of uh, an actual free marketplace. You know, it's not, ideas aren't allowed to thrive or, or be tested based on their own inherent merits. Um, so like, well, they, they say it's like a driver's license to have fun online. It's also the idea that it replaces your own identity. This is your, this is your license. This is your, your, um, your, your new image. So I think also that's also part of what was a big appeal for a lot of devs is that mm -hmm. they, um, before they were kind of like face doxed and working on the Ethereum <laughs> protocols and stuff and going to cons and all that. Um, they could, it, when they put on the Milady instead, they could like actually just free post. And it was very, it's very liberating feeling, especially because you're getting True. injected into a very like internet native timeline with all these other Miladies. And, you know, I kind yeah. of wrote out some pretty clear protocols on like, how to free post as a lady the mm. lady like uh, radical engagement at those I think, like just for like sure you know, every lady you see following each one of them which allowed them to have this experience of like a very accelerated zoomer style timeline that they often like you know didn't get a chance to to feel before it's a it's exhilarating yeah. if you've never seen it i feel like milady embodies an idea of like what does it look like to log in and win because there's so many uh examples now of like what does it mean to log in and lose right so logging in and losing is just like waste a bunch of time get brainwashed you know fall mm -hmm. fall fall into left right politics a lot like just you know uh yeah. read celebrity news a lot you know scroll mm -hmm. your feed a lot there's so many ways to get trapped and log basically log in and die or log in and lose and i feel like milady is almost like a to use a matrix analogy it's like you, you're jumping out of the matrix and you're now like with like people who are 
you know, using the internet as it's originally intended for, right? Like a revanchist mm-hmm. concept of like that, that crypto anarchist or that cyber mm-hmm. anarchist where people can now um, uh, create tremendous value through freedom of speech. Uh, I, think, mm-hmm. I think it's especially gonna be uh, powerful in the backdrop of, as you say, DEI and, you know, heightening calls for more censorship. If you just, I saw this meme today too, where like, if you just type in like, uh, uh, censorship is, and then the first five things Google will say is like important, needed, and like a few other things. So it's like, uh, it's quite a, it, it's quite a, I think we're definitely, the mainstream is moving more toward that at the same time that the world gets more polarized. So uh, I think Milady has a really unique uh, uh, vantage point uh, and shelling point really for, for people who are minded that in that way to come mm-hmm. together. But I guess I want to ask you what, what language communities do you see still mainly in the community? Do you, is it mainly like 95% English, Anglo speaking, uh, or do you see more and more like, you know, different communities, like different countries, mm-hmm. different languages, or how do you, or do you not monitor it at all? Like you just. No, I do. Um, <clears throat> it's majority English. For some reason we have a following in Estonia. Um, I'm not exactly sure why, but I, I think it's also downstream of my Mia posting. I think there's just a contingent of like right-wing nationalist Estonians who are have become inadvertent like big Vermilia fans. Um, I've just heard heard those rumors, um, and wow. uh, and uh, yeah, we'll, um, I've been reached out uh, by them, and we'll eventually do a rave there probably. Um, we also have Chinese fans um, and and Japanese, but those come mostly from the from traders, not really from the, the sense of lady posting. Um, mm. I'm currently in Seoul. We're setting up a rave night here, like we do in London, which is like not tied to any Ethereum or NFT convention, but instead a proper subculture night, like working with like local DJs for a kind of you know distinct style and sound with this like break core, anime core, Kiaru look. Um, I expect it to, it to be successful, hopefully. We'll um, make it a regular night. And this is again, like one of the things where I expect them not to become Milady holders, but just mm-hmm. active on like the Milady Discord and Twitter scene once they start to get integrated into it. Do you see it as like, I mean, I understand that you, you support a lot of subculture and a vibe. And do you see corporate culture as becoming, I mean, what, I, I guess stepping back more, like what do you, how do you define accelerationist? And how do you define, you know, what you called effective accelerationism? Uh, so when I refer to accelerationism, I refer to Nick Land um, who, uh, Essentially, the, the take is that um, capitalism is inevitable. It's a process of thermodynamics, and it'll always go towards um, increasingly complex self-organization for the sake of reaching equilibrium, meaning basically that advancement of all, like human civilization, technology, it's all towards just increasing efficiency and or, you know, organizing resources, and eventually to the point of building an AGI. Um, so when, when I refer to accelerationism, my accelerationism in lands is one that considers that a direct inevitability. Um, it's a non-negotiable. Uh, effective accelerationism and most other forms treat it as negotiable. Effective claims that they don't, but they do. They like, they're like they dancing on the edge of like, oh, they'll say it in their manifesto that it's non-negotiable, but then when you actually hear their discussions on it, um, they always like kind of try to play on the side of a little bit less of an extreme take. Um, so it's kind of become popular in the Bay really more as like a sports team that people sign up to against the safetyist. And it really just has come to mean that, well, I think it's okay and good to continue pursuing AI without breakers um, because in like vaguely they, they feel that, you know, this AGI is on an issue. Let's just pursue it and see what happens compared to the safetyist or the the ones that want to pause AI entirely, I think that they, they should be seriously concerned about 
AI safety. My belief is that there's no possibility to actually engineer any kind of safetyism into AI. It's not one that it's not something that we can control. It's not something that we're putting in place ourselves. The, the non-esoteric explanation of that take is that simply that um, if it wasn't in the Bay, some team of AI safetyists in San Francisco, the some guys in China or anywhere else or in the DOD will produce an AI without those those breakers, um, and it'll be more effective. So it it'll outcompete whatever you do in, in the Bay. Um, there's not like some sci-fi uh, timeline where we we just like code it correctly in the perfect way that they're benevolent to humans and then they outcode whatever other teams are working on uh, drone strike them or whatever um, it's mm. it's it'll it'll just happen naturally out of just the, the competition of capitalism that's also partly why we make a do the chinese posting um it's indirectly a reference or just a general like neo-orientalism as i call it or appraisal of like china part of it is just recognizing that they're culturally going through a, a kind of renaissance that's very digitally minded um there's a lot to uh, a lot of very, very interesting like, products of that but also it's this kind of indirect accelerationist reference to the, the China is an alternative. If we don't do it, China will, basically. Interesting. So like, how do you, how do you think about, how do you think about, I mean, you mentioned Department of Defense, uh, you know, the people talked, talked about a bit about, you know, your, your Palantir background and how do you think about, how do you think about, let's say government, anarchy, internet, AI, like how, how, how do you see the role of government? Well, my, my reference to the DOD just now is just that there, I'm sure that there's a lot of active interest in developing AI. It's not just what you see publicly. Yeah. I mean, even if the major advance, advances are in these public companies working open source, they're going to look at everything they're doing and then take from it what they need to build um, their own, you know, AGI. It's necessary. It's, I'm, I'm sure it's an arms race of all governments in the world right now, um, all major ones anyway. Um, uh, as it relates to anarchy, I mean, my my position regarding the state is uh, generally, I'd prefer their non-intervention, especially because I think the modern states are very corrupt. I, I expect the US empire to collapse, but I don't know if it'll happen within my generation, but I think it's some, it's in a, it's in its, you know, fall stage in terms of the cycle of empires um and on a personal level or what i'd recommend to my my lady followers is just generally you know staking out a homestead of sorts a safe um locale for your family um with as much avoidance of as the government as possible but it's not like i don't so like with that frame of mind is why I don't like engage in like things like right wing and left wing politics. It's like I feel that it's just entirely we're in a descent of an empire that um you know, regardless, it's just corruptive, it's corrosive. I think the state itself is uh willfully engineers the kind of destitution of its population, even on a biological level with the so what what my interest in Kind of esoteric health is, is preventative from from government government interference mm. in our in our health. For sure, we definitely share an interest there. I mean, if you just look at the government, um, or rather, cor- you know, corporate crony capitalist interests, right? Uh, the the way that uh, farming is done, the way that seeds mm-hmm. are pat- patentable, uh, mm-hmm. and just the way that the whole you know food apparatus is is done it's actually you're right it's to actually make you sicker it's to make people weaker right yeah um, my, uh, my conspiracy theory is that it's a product of um democracy and that it it it's helpful to have a more subjugated population so they naturally true. evolve to create kind of institutional uh the kind of diminution of 
your biological substrate of your population. Yeah. I think it's also a product of the blend of capitalism and uh, big government, right? Because whenever you have, let's say, unfettered capitalism, and then you also have uh, government who can be captured, then you end up with these situations, right? So you'll end up with something where, um, you know, How House of Pain is a good book about the Sackler painkiller empire, right? Where, you know, he, mm -hmm. he said all the right shibboleths, he donates all the right universities, but then he's really just over-prescribed, hey, he's having doctors over-subscribe painkillers to middle-aged women as a business model, right? Mm -hmm. um, but that's almost celebrated, I think, in an ironic way or in a cynical way in the U.S., where there there is that kind of um, that kind of energy. Uh, so you know, just from a historical precedent, uh, you know that that book, The Last Kings of Shanghai, that I recommended recently on my Twitter. You know, it it chronicles the two Jewish, uh, the Baghdadi Jewish uh, families in Shanghai. Uh, one, um, which was uh, much more in favor of just like pro profiting from the opium trade. Uh, in the other, which was less so, but still profiting from things of different sorts, and I and I do think that it's not it's not avoidable that the the best monopolies or the best profit opportunities will tend to be from, you know, when you can just capture government and then sell it as a monopoly, something that people probably shouldn't be allowed to have or don't even need, but you create the market for it anyways, right? Like that that's kind of the blueprint. So I, I guess my my per personal view of cap capitalism has always been. Not, not from a cynical point of view, more so, but just from the point of view that uh, you need kind of, if you're going to have state capitalism, it's actually it's like state capitalism is actually better than partial democracy capitalism. Because in democracy capitalism, uh, the interests of shareholders are not ever going to be that aligned with the interests of uh, the people, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know. What you yeah, think. I, I mean, that comes back to Chinese theory as well, because, you know, Ch Chinese communist theory is very much about the decadence of the West, how it's been unable to control. And that's why you've had all these bans on like mobile games. You've had all these, you know, the ban on crypto is a little, little bit similar, but uh, a bit separate. But, you know, they they've just banned stuff where they've said, you know, there's actually no innovation here. It's just people playing more, you know, nonsense that's not going to help people. So, yeah, no, I, I think the role of a government should just be the protection of its people and intervening in capitalism where it can be without corruption identified as just something that's negative i, uh, I do agree like uh, in korea also i'm saying right now it's i think it's very funny but very good that they they don't let kids play video games after like 10 p.m they, they just like uh block they cut out their their ability to use it you have to like log in with some kind of social identifier or sort of ssn that um, if you're under 18, mm. like you just you just can't access uh, online gaming from like 10 p.m. to like 8, 8 a.m. so that people stay they sleep they they get their full sleep before school. Um, mm. I do I do think uh, from an anarchist perspective, I think like the reason why I would be completely against the U.S. for example having that kind of control is because I wouldn't trust the government to use it actually in the citizens best interest but if they were if they were trustworthy as a uh, you know as a state then i wouldn't be exactly opposed to it the problem is just the, the risk of corruption yeah so you're so how how much of you know after you've gone through the legal stuff with the milady lawsuit and you know the doxing and so on you know how was that to go through as an experience like what like how was um you know, how do you feel about it? And, uh, you know, what's been your journey there? Oh, yeah. Well, you know, I've um, I've been in corporate litigation before, so that element is nothing new to me. I'm very yeah, familiar in this space. Uh, but uh, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, the, I can't talk much detail about it, but the whole thing is uh, off the record. It is a very funny story. It's incredibly stupid, um, and just like very destructive. Uh, actions taken by some very confused people who I think still struggle to understand exactly uh, how fucked that they are. <laughs> so it's just kind of absurd to watch the, their stubbornness. Um, and it was very unfortunate that they created so much damage to our market cap and created this FUD publicly. But 
obviously, I mean, I think this morning we just we broke out to new all time highs. We hit like 220 million market cap. Um, we've completely recovered as people realized just how incredulous the, the claims they were making were, as well as just, you know, with an old five months since we've just continued to power on without any issue. I think it's become self evident that um, whatever claims that they had shared to the timeline was uh, just untrue. Do you um, think they were confused because they they were greedy or do you think they were emotional about some aspects of it or like what do you I think, think their source of yeah i mean i think they were blinded by greed maybe um these guys were all my mm -hmm. friends before i hired them so i think there was also an element of like that feeling that uh to see somebody succeed that they thought well you're the same level as me type of thing this would become mm -hmm. more and more envious um it was a it wasn't like they had ever believed that much in Romilia when they were hired. You know, it's a classic example of like you hire people early on, but it's not like they ever want to negotiate options or anything like that. They just have, they're there for the mm -hmm. pay. Then a few years later, your you know your startup's successful, and now they look back and kind of want to renegotiate retroactively to get the reward without any of the risk. You know, it's yeah. so kind of as soon as it went live, like. I got texted by multiple people that run startups around the space and it's like a classic for sure. story. Very yeah. classic. Yeah. It does have a good lesson for the other side too, which is that if we, if you ever join a startup and even though you're just there for the pay, you should just negotiate some options anyways, because like, then at least you won't regret it and come to hate what you've done if it does really well. Right. And sometimes yeah, like but... attitude is such a interesting, yeah. Like, cause I'm sure if they, right when they joined it, they said, man, I really believe in this stuff. Like I want some upside. You would have given it probably, right? And it, But it's something where because they really did just come for the pay, it becomes something where later on, I mean, from your point of view, I'm sure as a founder, you, then you're like, well, you know, you may think of yourself as a co-founder, but I just paid you to, some money to do some tasks and that's what you did. So that, Yeah, that I mean, they, they know they weren't the co-founders they joined like uh, nine months after we started Familia. Um, they just invented that for their lawsuit, but as a part of their offense. But, uh, you know, even if they would have negotiated options, it, who stops them from like then wanting more retroactively more, a few years yeah. later when they realize they made a wrong bet. Sure, it's sure. like um, you're, you're like, you're making a trade and then you, you're trying to negotiate with the chart after it, you know, you, you're, you bet wrong. Mm. Um, yeah, you like, sized way too small, and now you're trying to go back and beg everybody to let you uh, increase your position <laughs> size right after it's gone up a 10x. Yeah, exactly. So th this is your second podcast ever, if I'm right, right? The first one being during the anorexia cult days. Do you think? <laughs> yeah, well, do you think it, it wasn't during? It was a uh, right after the, the Nazi cult days. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was right after the the cancel had come out onto CT. I did a podcast with somebody that was not even a, a CT podcaster. He's uh, it was on Contain. There, he's more read, listened to by like the Red Square audience. It's like New mm. York, Boston art theory type. Um, it's kind of funny though because before I joined the call, he had done this introduction which I couldn't hear, and I didn't realize he was like very solemn. He uh, was acting as if he was like about to interview a serial killer or somebody like the Unabomber had just you know bomb bombed the university wow. and now he was having a chance to interview like he was saying how you know this is for i don't necessarily agree with anything that might be discussed it's just for the chance to for posterity to hear from the perspective i come in and i'm just laughing about it because the whole thing was obviously like anybody that's looked at it it's just a troll there's no nazi anorexia cult uh, we we invented that because our friend was getting canceled for basically liking some racist and uh, thin spo tweets on her private Twitter. And we thought it'd be really funny if you just deflected the cancel by saying, no, it wasn't me. I was groomed by this cult into liking, into being a racist and being anorexic. And then created mm. like fake, I mean, uh, fake like iMessage group chat, like shots or whatever to, to like make it seem real with the whole fake Instagram, <laughs> expo expose it, exposing Instagram. I feel like, yeah, media nowadays, the way that it's like, the, the IQ has gone to near zero. I, and like, 
the analytical thinking has gone to near zero and it's so AI based as well. I feel like it creates unprecedented opportunity for performance art, like what you've done, right? Because well, you can kind of game the algorithm, game the, yeah. At a certain point, uh, like the whole Milady thing, it's impossible to explain like the series of like seven recursive cancels that went on in Milady. Yeah. Like any normal person, right? Like if I were to try and sit down with my mom who like loves me, she really wants to understand what I'm doing. And I were to try and say like, okay, this is, this is the whole thing from the start to finish. She would tap out after like the first cancel and a half, right? She would just be like, what the hell is going on here? This doesn't make any sense. <laughs> uh, and so like, imagine somebody who like isn't my mom and has no actual motivation to like try and understand this on that level, right? Like your aunt, for instance, like, yeah. Yeah, like they just say, oh, this is insane. Like you guys are like weird, insane freaks. And then that's their understanding of it and they move on. True. Because what I realized also is it's so impossible to get people to pay attention to anything also. Like the attention mind share is just incredible. So like anyone who looks at a milady, let's say, and they hear about the Nazi anorexia, they don't know if it's true or false, whatever. They're just like, what, what, like, what was that? But then they don't want to know really either because they're like, I'm probably just getting confused here anyways. It yeah, becomes like this thing where- ability to know. Like there's no amount yeah. of like they actually can't focus on the subject long enough to like dig and figure it out on themselves, right? Like this is something that if anyone who's like listening to this podcast needs to understand that like the attention span that you have that allows you to listen to a podcast puts you in like the top two percentile of people globally, right? Like most people can't even do like 15 minutes of focus. That's true. On something. Podcast is the new reading. Just like yeah. reading was the like reading was the new chanting, and then when reading first came out, uh, everyone was like, "This is ridiculous! You're you're reading words now. Like we should be like mem like reciting and memorizing them." And yeah, then now we're like podcast written text to remember this this yeah, Homeric yeah. Uh, poem. Exactly, and then now we're in podcasts, and like when podcasts came out, like audiobooks especially, I, I think the snobs among us were all like. You need to like hear your book in order to like consume it. Like, why not just read it? And then, um, you know, and then now we're at the point where like, you know, uh, wow, like I can listen to a whole podcast on one X speed. I'm such like a concentrated person. Like you have to like watch it on two X speed or you have to like yeah. watch clips. Like, like where is it going? It's pretty scary place it's going, I think. It's going to be like Neuralink instantaneous, right? You're just going to have emotions shoved into your frontal cortex. <laughs> Probably. Well, I mean, you start you start realizing uh, sort of what you're dealing with, I guess, when you have like enough of a platform. And like if you have a message and you want people to like actually absorb it and you realize like the things that you have to do, right? Like you need to take every word out of your post that has like a, a Lexile score of over like five, right? If it has three <laughs> syllables, it's fucked. Take it out. Uh, you need to you need to just tone it down to the absolute dumbest and barest minimum, and it it can never be long. Like you can't if you have a video, it has to cut off at exactly like 15 seconds, uh, and that's the only way you can be sure that people actually like get the message. Anything outside of that, and it's like you have to just understand that uh, they're not going to get it. <laughs> no. Hey, sorry it's guys. It's actually. We were talking about performance art and like media and the internet these days and how you, uh -huh. the, the, the fake cancels when you were talking about that. Yeah. So, um, it's actually what part of what motivated the kind of things that we were doing on, back on Mia in the Kaliak days. Um, you know, one of the things I talk about was uh, deep fake reality. And my, my point was that it's inevitable what, what you see right now with AI, like, uh, OpenAI, Sora, and um, uh, like Midjourney, fake imagery. Um, it's right now we're just at the cusp where it'll actually start to treat people that aren't just boomers on Facebook, but people like you and me, where actually like AI-generated fake media would be indistinguishable from any kind of real photograph. What what we'll see at that point is a shift away from media derived truth, which was kind of the paradigm of maybe the last 50 years or about a hundred years, but 
not prior to that, um, before truth was derived from either community leaders like at your church or your own perception mm -hmm. uh, and, and kind of social consensus uh, against uh, people's different perceptions. Um, it's a kind of consilience based truth, of just a, yeah. a sort of a, a, a summation of your local community's um, perceived beliefs. Uh, so that's a super that's a super accurate point because a lot of people don't remember it, but newspapers, uh, they when they first came around, let's say, you know, late nineteenth century, uh, it was very expensive actually to print these. So at least in the Chinese and Japanese context, they would have been always for political journals, right? They would have been started with a political aim and it was read mm -hmm. by a few people and by the elite. And there would have been a, uh, like, that's why you still see now, like in China, that there, there's like propaganda studies is indistinguishable from media studies because there was never the idea that media is something other than propaganda. Like you, you wouldn't have a concept of it, right? Uh, uh -huh. as being indistinguishable uh they and, and, and I think, it's not yeah. it's not a new thing for the news to be lying it, it's always been the case there's always been yes the yeah and then in the in the u.s context too right like it was a you know the 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 william randolph hearst concepts of like you know if you're rich you have to buy the newspaper so that they stop flooding you basically right like mm -hmm. that's kind of the main the main value accrual of media is a governance token right that's why the media is eventually owned by the richest people in every in that country because they're like, okay, I, I I need to govern the protocol so it doesn't pay me out to be the bad guy, right? So I, I think that you're you're absolutely right that with the AI ad advent of you know just making a lot of questions of like when people communicate to other people as strangers in mediums that are. Uh, that are mass in nature, uh, what can we learn from things that are communicated in mass and what can we learn from things that are communicated not in mass, right? So I think th there's that super skepticism eventually of like, well, th this is mass produced or th this is made for mass consumption. Well, you know, it's like the chicken that's grown over 30 days and weighs three times a normal chicken that, you know, grown for six or 12 months, uh, same concept I feel. So, but I don't know how the world was gonna react to that change because I think that there is such a difficulty of like, do people have enough real communities outside of mass culture, mass consumerism, like mass mm -hmm. media? Cause the average, well, cause like Malady's do of course, but do I, other- And I think that's the direction things will go. Um, it's tribalism is, I think like, mm -hmm. We talk about like network spirituality and lady as a cult, but I, I I don't think we'll be unique. And I think five years it'll be quite normalized to have these sort of tribal internet cults because people will be so lost for consensus meaning. That they'll need to find networks that they trust, um, and when you have a network that you trust that's localized, it's very easy for them to then become radicalized in certain directions because of their isolated truths. Uh, I think I think we're at the we're just like exploring a bleeding edge that we'll see be normalized over the next decade um, with like zoomers that are growing up into this space. Um, so like going back to like our trolling with Mia, it was sort of this embrace of recognizing that media isn't truth. So even with like Mia was originally like presenting itself as a like it's like catfishing is like first a Chinese girl, then like a trans girl. And like, it was doing it in a way that was fully plausible on the measures of like, you know, I'd just get some girl to uh, take a, uh, a timestamp selfie. And, and that used to be all you needed to prove that you're a girl online. Um, mm -hmm. Now, like, uh, it, it's a, it would be a totally, nobody would, you couldn't believe it, regardless if you do a full video showing, you know, you're talking, it can all be deep faked. Uh, there's a certain point where people will stop really caring uh, whether or not it's real. You follow like a AI influencer that's actually an old man but with Chinese girl face filters. Um, there's a certain point where you don't actually care whether or not that's the case. Like you watch a VTuber and you just 
you're happy to have a suspension of grief, the disbelief um, yeah. that you know it's an anime girl that you're looking at, even if it's, if it's with a full face changer. So, yeah. you know, it leads back into kind of post identity. True. Also, you know, in post reality, kind of, or or post like what what is what is uh, content like? I, I saw a debate recently about you know, can you if you make like AI. Let's say you use AI to like undress people and then you post those, like, should that be banned? Should that be legal? Is that art? Is it profane? Is that defamation? Is that something? And obviously different societies have a very different take on it because from some point of view, it's like, you know, it's just blatant defamation. But from other points of view, it's like, you know, what is the difference at this point between a person, let's say, closing their eyes and then imagining something versus them posting it like, on the internet, like mm -hmm. let's say they post it in private on the internet versus like a public blog versus like distributed. Like at the end of the day, you know, you, you've had a few of these lawsuits where that that is the reason, and then it always attracts more attention to the AI nudes than the original nudes, right? So mm -hmm. I do wonder, like, are we in the first innings of that kind of, you know, people are reacting in horror at what you can do with AI, uh, and then later they're just like, why do I care if people can make an AI version of like you know, uh, people doing stuff, right? Like how, how can you right. ban it? You can't possibly ban it. And then why do you care at that point, right? Like Lucas can imagine, you know, uh, people doing things. Uh, if he were to a animate them through AI, is it is it now wrong? Like it's, it's very, very hard to say like, what is reality? What is consciousness, right? Yeah, I, I, I think these are very temporary debates because you're right, it, it's inevitable. Even if it takes maybe, um, 10 years, there will be a point where we all have some Google Glass AR uh, frame over our vision that you'd be able to do it right in front of the person, you know, the person's right in front of you, you're talking to them and you have an AI filter redecorating them any, any way you want. Um, you, it's, it's, it'll get to a point where you'll, you'll be able to just filter reality to um, whatever avatars you want you could be a furry and see everybody else's furries or communicate mm. how you want your avatar to be seen in these glasses it's it's a it's like i think before apple vision people thought that vr was never going to be normalized it's just a gimmick and i think now suddenly they realize oh actually it's plausible if this is just more lightweight i would use it um and i, I think it's the same for also a kind of always on ar all it needs to do is just get to a point of like more where uh, the, the hardware is just efficient enough to be more wearable um ai uh filters are fa just to be faster but there'll be a point where you can see it it's just inevitable these are things that because it, when i talk about like the trajectory of uh capitalism going in just one direction of techn technological evolution you can kind of see that there are certain things that are bound to happen and this is something that is bound Actually, I was talking to Lucas about like about uh, work from home and the remote work debate, and I told him, you know, my take on it is really just that it just happened too early because of COVID. Suddenly, people were sent remote, and it really wasn't ready for the remote revolution. But it is inevitable. But it's going to be inevitable when there's an easy, advanced VR, and we'll just have a kind of office environment app that you'll virtually work in an office but remotely from home. Uh, I think that's a very easy, inevitable bet. I just couldn't tell you the timeline for it. It's, only it's very funny also because all the consulting firms and the big finance firms, they have these like increasingly dystopian monitoring mechanisms that they're in placing. So like uh -huh. they'll have, uh, if they have like someone working from home, they'll have a webcam monitoring their eyes, making sure <laughs> that they're not like looking off the screen or something like that. Uh, and they basically found that there's sort of like a linear increase in productive output from an employee with the increase in like weird draconian measures uh, like to monitor them like that. And uh, the VR is like the ultimate form of that. Like VR will be able to tell everything about like your biometrics, where you're looking, what's up on the screen, all this other stuff. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, like if your employer hits you with the employee monitoring software through VR, uh, it may be over. Yeah, so I mean, uh, it's, it's one of the big advantages. Um, it's also, 
I think you can quite well replicate the office environment because what you're missing in VR, like when you're on a, let's use like VR chat for um, VR socialization. The main thing you're missing is the feeling of touch and taste, which is two things that you don't ever experience in an office environment anyway. All the other senses are well replicated. Um, so any advantages you get of the office environment, I think, are much much more cheaply covered with just by issuing like VR um, headsets to all your employees. So you talked about homesteading before. I just want to touch on that quickly. Like, do you think that people should, in general, uh, be living off grid? I mean, have 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 you looked at off grid living and that kind of thing? Oh well, when I say homesteading, it doesn't necessarily. I don't mean like actually literally off grid. Um, I think that's fairly. Uh, <laughs> It's unrealistic unless you're um, Kanye West or somebody like actually buying, you know, some 50 acres and you have uh, your slave servants on site managing your house for you. Um, but a more like a conceptual homesteading where you, mm. you yourself are on it. It's just it's you your, and your household and your family. Um, I talk about a dynasty mindset and I think in those terms of like building a family that of sons that you treat as like a tribe or like a, a like a, a monarchist kingdom that you support each other as a bloodline and build from that mindset. Um, it, it, I, what I, I, I think would happen, especially as we talk about like a, a, a new remote revolution coming from VR is um, we'll see a, a lot more of kind of the sort of white flight suburbia is the word now it's like white asian flight <laughs> but um these kind of uh high median income uh, suburban enclaves at least i'm talking about the us here but that exist um some you know an hour or two outside of the major airports and cities um the the that are just uh they avoid all the the common problems of um you know the urban environment that you see so often like in discourse these days um, whilst not having the issue of um, a lack of access to to uh, work opportunities. You see it right now in places like Western Virginia or Van California, where a lot of offices have started to move out to from the major cities. But I think eventually there won't be a reliance on that kind of um, you know, office complexes. Yeah, I've seen the U.S. like people now like, take over these old office buildings in the suburbs and then they like live in them or something or they refurbish them they become yeah. like condos or something and it's just really funny like it becomes like your like your mall becomes like a like a big penthouse just like um yeah i mean they the the first wave of that was uh with converting like old factories and warehouses into these you know warehouse lofts um and yeah. like industrial manufacturer left the us yeah now it's as companies start to abandon office real estate, converting that as like the next way of, of uh, I don't know, of changing, repurposing the old American infrastructure. Cool. Well, we've talked about an hour and a half. Anything uh, else we should discuss? I don't know. Uh, Lucas, any ideas? Is there anything that you guys wanted to talk about, uh, maybe outside of the Vermilia sphere, but in terms of like broader, uh, I guess, financial direction that the crypto space is taking or any parallels you see to TradFi, stuff like that? Uh, actually, I have a question for you, sir. If you had to sure. ex explain um, Vermilia and the ladies' ascendancy, uh, it's bull case, why, why you see the market um, reaction you do you know it's, it's it kind of has an odd relation to the rest of the nft market what would your analysis be i would say it's the i mean depends on who i would, like what, what what kind of a expert level i'd be explaining to i think for crypto natives i would explain it as you know this has the strongest uh resiliency right so it can and there's no there's no kind of like big expectation of of let's say you know it's not a yuga lab situation where uh there's like a game being made there's no milady game coming there's no milady metaverse coming 
uh, it's just very resilient and uh, the network is the strongest in terms of just, you know, people who have mind share, who are using it, who are talking about it. Uh, I think we see that, especially the last few weeks with Retardio and the study stuff. And it's just like, uh, mm -hmm. you know, mo most of the big meme coins are, are Milady adjacent at this point. So I think that's what I would say to natives. I think I zooming out, what I would say to, uh, you know, maybe non-crypto people um, or pe people who have maybe have heard of punks, maybe heard of apes and think maybe I'm buying now like punks at one ETH or something like that, or like apes at a few ETH. Like, what would that feel like? And I would say like, this is what it feels like to be early, right? When you're early, it's like, it feels a little bit weird, but it's cool. Whenever something feels weird, but cool on the internet, you want to dig a lot into it. That's generally the trend of the internet since the beginning. Um, if it's weird, but you don't find it cool, well then, you know, maybe it's not for you, but if you find it cool at all, you know, dig into it. And, and then, you know, that that's uh, where we are in that trajectory. Whereas I think a lot of NFT sets, you know, like I actually get this asked the question a lot by Chinese people because in China, I think Azuki's are pretty popular, especially among Chinese diaspora. So like Hong Kong and Singapore, Azuki's are very popular. Um, mm -hmm. And today, notably, uh, Miladies have flipped Azuki's quite convincingly, right? And I was asked on a Chinese AMA just last month, like, you know, why do you support Miladies? Why not support Azuki's? Like Azuki's look, like, look cooler. And I was like, well, first of all, first of all, um, oh, and they also said like Azuki suits your brand more. And I was like, first of all, you don't know what my brand is if you think Azuki suits my brand because I don't see how it, like I I don't feel any like I, I think Azuki's are cool, but I don't feel any attachment to them when I see them. And I also think that um, I I think that that's actually the problem with most NFT sets, which is that they're overly financialized from the beginning so that people are really like, people like to buy expensive NFTs in general, because when it gets high, it's like, okay, I'm joining a rich people's club, right? People don't usually join poor people's membership clubs, right? If there was like a homeless person club, you wouldn't pay much to join it. Cause you also wouldn't like you even join it in the first place. But, but here the, the difference is that like you could join a homeless person's club and then these people all, you know, log on and win and then they get better and better. So. I think that, that I think that people need to understand like the the concept of what communities uh, are easy to grow and hard to shrink, and which ones are more brittle or fragile. Well, like you said in the beginning, right? Actually, most meme coins they're incredibly fragile, and the, and the reason for that is because if you look at the life cycle of even words of like vocabulary, they usually go in and out of style within about ten to twenty years. So all the words that I thought were like cool words to say when I was growing up, I can't use them anymore. If I use them, I dox myself as a boomer, right? Uh, <laughs> sometimes Khan and I, we, we still use these words. I mean, I'm not even gonna say them because they're so embarrassingly lame. Like I'll, I'll get unfollowed by Zoomers all day, I think if I use these words, but you know, and then Zoomers use these words as if it's just like language, but then in 10 years, like no one's gonna know what these words mean. And they're gonna be like, these are r really lame words to be using when speaking. So memes, it's just very hard to, to uh, long-term create a community. So which coins have done that? Or like Bitcoin has done that. Punks has done that. Ethereum has done that. You know, other stuff remains to be seen, but yeah, Solana probably is doing that. But like, th that's the kind of thing where for 10,000 memes, there's one that makes it, right? For, for 10,000, you know, belief systems, there's one that makes it. So I think uh, Milady, from the point of view of anti-fragility uh, is it, is probably the most investable NFT asset of this cycle. I think that, you know, Punk's also, I, I think is investable, but I think other stuff you, you're depending, I mean, Penguin's also, if you look at the community is also, is also good, but like, it's just, it's a very different, um, it's a very different energy I feel compared to your normal kind of uh, NFT cycle uh, mm -hmm. where, like you said, it doesn't rely on, you know, there's like a very low chance uh, normal, normie, normie or normoid celebrities are going to be like, this is an anorexic Nazi cult. Here I am. I'm joining. What do I sign up? Right? Like, it's very unlikely that that happens. And so I think for that reason, uh, the dynamics around that cycle are going to be different. It trades kind of counter uh, cyclical to the NFT market in some ways. It has a like, very low correlation, right? Mm -hmm. It's probably the most like, I think it's the most CT native at this point by far. But I think it'll mm -hmm. also become the most counterculture native. So. 
Yeah. The yeah. pitch that I always use for Milady is um, at a time when basically every NFT out there was telling people that like you you couldn't use the intellectual property or we're going to sue you. Like Bored Apes was saying, if you wear an ape that you don't own, like we're going to sue you. Uh, Charlie was like, yeah, dude, just like right click, save it and wear it if you like it. Like, fuck it. I don't care if you buy it or not. Uh, <laughs> and it's like, it's such a basic thing now. Like pretty much everybody understands like you you shouldn't be copy uh, copywriting your intellectual property for like NFTs. But like at the time, it was really like bizarrely unique. There weren't a lot of people doing that, which is insane because it's like crypto is a very, uh, you know, it has like a very anarchist spirit to it. And the idea of saying we're going to sue you if you use our monkey picture was just like so uh, market misaligned that being the only group to actually do that at the beginning was kind of like, oh, well, they're just not retarded. Like they get it. They're not retards. Yeah, you know, I, I do notice that in crypto and really in startups in general, a lot of a lot of people just take a shotgun approach and sometimes they get they get it right and they're lucky, but they don't really understand what they did right and often then they can't pivot well enough to to, to hold on to whatever they did they did find. I think Yuga, for example, was very smart when they raised and then backed out and hired a CEO in their place. Um, I think some other projects, like I think Luca runs Pudgy very well. And actually, I mean, he, he acquired Pudgy from another team that didn't really know what they were doing. Um, but there are some things that are just, they, they do it because they know it's what the market has previously done. And they don't really uh, uh, consider any of the, the decisions they're making. They just follow what they've known has worked in the past which to some degree is good. You should, um, we kept the 10K uh, supply when we launched Milady because I knew that this was something that was understood by the market and you don't want to innovate too much. If you create something too confusing, then it doesn't trade well because you don't want to overwhelm the buyer. It, uh, it should be kind of straightforward any innovations you do make. But something like Yuga's original pitch that if you buy a board ape and then you can use this for marketing things such as your board eight water, your board eight TV show, um, and it will increase the value of your specific P PFP because you've marketed it, marketed it in some product that you own the IP to. It's um it's so obviously wrong if you take a minute to even think about it. Uh, obviously, what's being marketed as a whole is board apes. It's not your specific board ape with the cowboy hat. You're never gonna attract unique value to it because it became the star of a TV show or whatever else you think of. Uh, so just by thinking about that for a second and realizing what's valuable is just Milady, as a Milady, it's not any specific Milady, but just Milady period proliferates as much as possible to capture as much mind share as you can is the value proposition. So, which is what ended up happening that before we even mint it out, people would kind of start pointing out, they keep seeing these Miladies everywhere. And then eventually CT kind of realized, wait, this collection hasn't even minted out, but I, I, every other dev I know is wearing it and they're the most talked about at these crypto conferences. So then they suddenly like, when they, they just like, what happened was like in March at some point, they kind of just noticed that this collection they've been seeing everywhere hadn't even minted out. So then they went out and, and minted it out and that was Miladies first pump. But, the, the first goal was just getting mindshare and just spreading as far and wide as possible. I mean, we had derivatives before we had even met it out. Um, it's a, it's a, it was a strategy that worked, but it's also something that, I don't know. I mean, when we launched Milady, I could have told you it would work even before it did. It's not like I was just doing scattershot. It just happened to. Um, I, so as you say, it's like, yeah, it's, it's obvious. I don't know. It's retarded how, how other projects couldn't see that. I mean, it's the same too. So it's true for a pivot with uh, capturing NFT liquidity um, by like making a big commitment to uh, decentralize and like DeFi NFT tooling, like um, like NFTX and, uh, and Pseudoswap. And really- Oh my God, this was the most insane thing to see in the market was every single yeah. NFT proponent just saying like, no, like Charlie's an idiot, dude. Like <laughs> NFT shouldn't have liquidity. It's actually bad if you have liquidity for nfts <laughs> yeah I, i'm still shocked they still really don't but there's not many projects that have also follow along to make that commitment 
they still don't get it really. Um, there's also like the fact that royalties would get driven out by the moment a another open sea competitor came out with a few war and it would end up driving to zero. That was something that's just it was obvious. I was writing about that before we ever even launched Milady. Um, it was it was it was inevitable. So I, when Blur came out and then there was this big discourse and debate on the timeline how Blur, Blur is ruining NFTs, first by offering like bid liquidity and also by driving royalties down to zero. I'm shocked how none of these teams could see it coming. Um, that's also why a pivot to NFT liquidity is smart because of, you know, you're not relying on royalties to generate fees and so you're, you're getting volume from, you know, your LPs. So, so what's next for Remelia Corporation? Are, are you going to do a token at some point? Or are you going to launch more sets or airdrops or what, what are you thinking? Um, that is confidential. We, uh, okay. we can't talk about it on this podcast. Noted. I have to, I have to keep everything very close to chest at the moment. Sounds bullish. Gotcha. 